Welcome everybody to Coach's Corner. We're going to give a little bit more time for other people to join uh, as uh, this is our first episode back from Penzik. Um, for those that didn't have a chance to go, we missed you. Uh, for those that did have a chance to go, it was uh, it was a great time. Uh, it's so nice to see all our friends uh, and we get to see a bunch of happy faces here online. Um, and you and hopefully we'll be able to give you a little bit of view of uh of what happened at Penzix this year? Um, there's lots of uh, lots of weather, lots of great fighting, um, lots of people, and uh, lots of fun. Pretty much like most Penzix are. So we look forward to uh, sharing that. Um, and tonight's episode is uh, on the Heroic Champions. Uh, this is a tournament that uh, happens every year at Penzix, and uh, our our get our, our host tonight, uh, Duke Brennan, is gonna kind of uh talk about that a little bit and all our good guests and introduce our guests uh each one of them uh have uh have, uh, we're lucky enough to have because they had a busy pensix this year and i'm sure they'll talk about that uh i'm gonna disappear i thank all you guys for showing up and and uh and i hope you guys have a great episode and uh brennan all yours man thanks brados um so i am excited to be joined tonight by the captains of the armored and rapier champion uh heroics champions teams from Pensic 49. from the kingdom of the middle we have duke valharic on the armored side and master elizabetta on uh the rapier side and from the east we have sir arn for armored and master thomas for rapier so folks first Thank you for giving up a Friday night to be here with us. I really appreciate it. Um, we had, uh, we had, let's see, something like 12 armored fights and 20 rapier fights uh, making up our Sunday and in out in the, standing out in the heat for a few hours. Um, so for those who don't know, this is uh, one point for each uh, in the Pensic War. And, uh, what happens is we have, for Armored, we have a call and response uh, scenario. So first side A, well, I uh, think of this, this year, uh, who went first? Uh, the East did. We were up in points at the time, and the rules dictated uh, that we were then responsible for putting out the first fighter. So the East went first this time. Great. Uh, so you put out uh, a champion, and then... Uh, the mid realm has a chance to respond, and then alternating back and forth uh, for the duration of the twelve bouts. Now, rapier does it a little differently. Uh, somebody want to talk to how y'all do that? Only slightly. Um, <laughs> we're ultimately doing the same thing. We just get together the night before, um, and we do our pairings not in the Sunday of. Um, Usually we have our process where the kingdom champions tend to, you know, take up the first one or two slots, depending on if the mid has a Kings or Queens champion. Um, and we make sure that the champions go first because typically the Royals want to watch their champions fight. Uh, then afterwards, we absolutely also do a call and response uh, where somebody who goes first decides whether they want to, you know, respond first or drop a name first and we go back and forth the exact same way we just do it the night before and then we go through and order the pairings so we try to have a better idea of who's going to be fighting when because a lot of us tend to get very grumpy standing out in the sun or not in the shade so we like to you know give everybody the in two more fights it's your turn to so start getting ready get warmed up or if you need to be cool loose whatever we try to make that space available for them and for rapier we also had cut and thrust bouts so we had to make sure that we were specifically matching up the cut and thrust combatants great so can uh i'm gonna put an open question to the field how when you're putting together your teams uh i know that uh i know that there is a certain amount where the crowns dictate you're gonna have x number of fights and something like for armored you're going to have x number of belts and y number of unbelts 
but can somebody talk to me about how you go about putting the teams together beyond that? What are the rules and what are the process you go through? Your Grace, if you'd like to go first. Uh, sure, I can do that. So the first thing that I look at is uh, this year was challenging because we couldn't have fighters um, do double duty in the belted and the unbelted and the belted uh, champions team was already very developed by the time I came in uh, to put my team together. So I looked at what assets that I that I had and I knew that I needed a good mix of um, knights. Um, our highest level unbelt is usually a very easy pick. We know who it is. He's likely going to be put on vigil. This is kind of the culmination of that. Um, and generally, that's a that's a pretty pretty much a no brainer. Um, I tried to to only represent one unbelt from the mid realm, thus mm -hmm. giving my allies. Um, a pretty good, uh, pretty good selection. And then, if I needed a, a bargaining chip, I could throw another al I unbelted fighter in to get a fighter that I particularly wanted. Luckily, most of most of the allies were very, very accommodating in uh, in giving me my suggestions to them. And that's how it's it's put. Uh, you know, the allied fighters, our allied fighters generally can fight whoever they say they want to fight but i try to i try to give them as much guidance and and a lot of times you know they want to see their heroes out there too so it's it's not um not too big of a deal and then the other thing that i want to make sure of is i want to make sure that i have answers for questions so i look at um weapon step uh if i have a fighter that that can fight at an extreme high proficiency in multiple forms, I will put a couple of those fighters in, or um, or definitely have some funny weapon depth as well. I think that's it. Arn, anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. So when it comes so to kind of go off of what His Grace was saying as well, the. I was given I was given this task to put this team together. I would say before the pandemic, when His Majesty Ryu was going to be warlord, he had brought me on to do this, and then the world shut down. Right. So um, when I was tasked with it this year, I looked for. Um, I also wanted to have just one representative regarding um, unbelts from the east, which is what we both had, uh, and I found that appropriate. Um, and then. I looked at the overall tournament record of Easterners and how they performed across the year and prior um, to give me who my who my givens are. Like who's like we both know that there's always going to be some big names out there that we can expect, right? And that's a part of the game all in itself, right? Who am I gonna have this year for Mainer? Who am I gonna have this year for Rumble? You know what I mean? That's a huge sure. part of it. Um, but in regard to allies, I feel like um, in consultation with his majesty throughout the year, just making sure I was giving fair representation as best I could to whom was declaring for us, um, I really wanted to use the, our allies for um, as mainly, mainly as questions, but also to have a couple key answers as well. Um, so very similar to what you laid out as well, uh, Dupar, um, also, uh, not so much bargaining chips as leeway. Fair? Fair. Absolutely. Uh, hey, Brennan, so, we got a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first one comes from our Steve colleague, Brados. Uh, <laughs> so, can you have alternates or do you have to pick everyone before Heroic starts? And I promise we're going to get to the Rapier folks in a minute. Uh, um, if, so I had a, there is the list that I woke up with on Sunday morning, right? I woke up and I had a list of 12 combatants, uh, and that did change a few hours after, a few hours, you know, after I got to the field to watch the young belts run and to watch the belts run the melee. So I didn't have say set alternates, but I did have 
back burner, hey, I know I can always go to X King or X King. Or at no point was I saying, oh, crap, so-and-so didn't show up. What am I going to do? I don't have a fighter. I could have had an alternate set, um, but I didn't feel I was in, and I didn't feel I needed to have that because I knew that we had enough of a, a robust um ally set up this year where I could go to whomever I need. Great. Uh, Valharic, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I um, I asked each of the allies to provide me with two belted fighters and an unbelted fighter, and I promised them that um, that I would fight, you know, one unbelt and one, one belted fighter. Um, I told them that I wanted a, a farm of, of people to pick from, and then that uh, whoever they sent basically made my alternate pool and also gave me another couple of guys of quality standing around with helmets on for you guys to guess, you know, oh, is Val going to send this guy or that? Um, I pretty much had my list solid, but it never hurts to have options. Great. Thank you. Um, so turning now to, to Rapier, when – you guys uh, do your pairings on Saturday night before the Sunday fights. Um, do you go in there, uh, and I'll post this first to Lizbetta, do you uh, walk in there with exactly 20 names, or do you come in there with 24, 25, 26, and, uh, and come out with the 20 that you really want to get you the point? Absolutely. So in this case, I did put together a list of the 20 names that I specifically wanted, but the, um, I did have a few alternates to move in there, which was helpful because uh, the East and their allies actually had some specific requests as to um, who they wanted to fight. And Thomas and I were working very hard to have fun fights, enjoyable fights, and good pairings. So we were able to accommodate those requests and move some people around between the melee champions and the heroic champions. Thomas, anything to add? Yeah, my initial plan going into this, I actually didn't want alternates as much as I was trying to make it very clear to people, you know, you're on the team, but being on the team doesn't mean that you get a fight on game day. I wanted people to pick from... Um, I didn't want to designate anybody an alternate ahead of time, because if you're the right answer to something, you're the right answer to something. Um, so I tried not to limit myself in that way. But as Elizabeth was saying, we got thrown a whole bunch of curveballs because sometimes you never know until Baron Bratz that one of your combatants uh, goes by the title, Your Majesty. And uh, they sometimes get to do things that, you know, you didn't expect that morning. <laughs> so, so showing... Uh, behind the curtain a little bit like this is. You referenced Beer and Brats. What's that? Something that I had never been to until uh, this year at Penzik. Uh, Same. <laughs> uh, although I have been behind it making pairings a couple of times and never actually been at it before. But from what I know, it's the point at which uh, the overall melee numbers are being discussed to even up sides and discuss what that is going to be in the gathering between the crowns. But for us, it was my opportunity to try and pin down the last of our allies who had not yet provided me with names of who they were going to be sending as champions. We tried to get as many as we could beforehand because we do like to do the pairings early, uh, but we were still chasing different kingdoms down and trying to get names so we could fill out the champions team. Before that started, I think I literally only had 15 names. I didn't even have a full team until after um, that meeting had officially started. I um, I used Beer and Brats, uh, which is, like you just said, a meeting regarding the crowns and, and, and the allied crowns going over the hard numbers of troops to make sure that there's a good spread and that the war is fair. Um, I used it as an opportunity to see who was in whose retinue, um, see who, like, for instance, if um, a king of a, of a of an allied kingdom has a bunch of real hot stick knights behind them walking around, you know, those are folks I'm going to look up on you. Hey, who is this guy? Hey, who is this guy? Or I also use it as an opportunity to, get, to have a nice sit down with Oharic as well. We have 
met in passing at Candlemas a few times, never really sat and, hey, man, I'm R, nice to meet you. So we had that opportunity, which was great, um, just to go over a couple really nitty gritty things for Sunday. And um, but I, you know, beer and brats was a, a fun, a fun time. But uh, I used it as best I could also to to really just observe the overall air of the of the war itself. Uh, anything different from your seat, Belhark? Uh, mostly beer and brats. Um, I used it to, to just firm up my. Uh, my ideas, and then also to see who some of the allies have sent. Uh, the big thing that I look for is not the best fighters, but more the most successful fighters. And when I'm when I'm making my roster, I would rather have a more successful fighter than someone who is who is greater skilled. So um, the other thing I'd like to. Uh, I've only uh, experienced Beard Brats from uh, the or, or meeting of the crowns, as it um, and, and as Brano says, yes, there is both beer and brats uh, present, um, but I've only experienced it from from the crown seat. I have not uh, done y'all's job uh, before, and I think that the core of the meeting for those who are unfamiliar with it is uh, is all the collective crowns of the known world getting together to try and make sure that uh, there is as even a fight uh, for the week as possible, not just for heroics on Sunday, uh, but what are the sides? Uh, Ethel Mark's bringing X number, Atlantia's bringing Y number, the East brings uh, this number, et cetera, um, and, and balance it all up and make sure that uh, all the crowns assembled are showing respect to everybody's PTO. You know, we've, we've all put in a lot of PTO uh, and uh, driven a long way for this and uh, everybody's trying to make it as fun as possible. So that's, that's the core of the meeting. Um, Lizabetta. So yes, I just wanted to say um, along to Thomas's point, um, it was an opportunity for us to meet with our allies as well. And whereas Thomas was given the um, opportunity to select the heroic champions, I um, was responsible with uh, another couple of the mods from our kingdom of putting together both heroic and melee. So I was meeting with the allies to confirm in which direction we were going to be putting our key combatants. Uh, I think there's one more question for folks before we get into the review of the fights themselves. Uh, from Bess, uh, why did the fencers outnumber fighters this year? And I will uh, addendum that. And is that uh, different from usual? Anybody want to field that? I mean, typically we actually, in years past, Rapier has had even more fighters than we fielded this year. Uh, so this was actually an unusually low number for us, which also sometimes makes it hard when you have allies who are expecting, you know, oh, well, we usually get like four slots on your heroics team. Yeah. We're like, we usually have more than 20 people fighting total. So um, that was the dynamic um, that, that we faced. I faced morning of i mean when we were uh during negotiations my my number that i wanted for rattan was 15. we ended up with 12 and during negotiations things got bumped up things got bumped down and um i remember someone someone suggested nine during negotiations for rattan and i go absolutely not so we found a medium which was 12. um and 12 compared to years past and I, i've been i've i've had a fight on sunday for the past this, this was my sixth year and there's, it felt, it felt like it, maybe because I was in, the, I was in the driver's seat, but it went fast to me, because um, there was only twelve rattan, you know, and I feel like there's been a whole lot more rattan, and and rapier. You're right in the, in the past, so it was just how negotiations went this year. Um, you know, we're always kind of at the mercy of that, you know. So those numbers get set by the crown year over year, and they're not the same. They are uh, not. Nope. Right. Uh, and anybody feel like they can weigh in on why the numbers aren't the same armored versus rattan i always felt it was a matter of representation which mm -hmm. i think is healthy and good 
Um, you know, if for the longest time, you know, uh, Pensick has been, you know, the rattan, you know, place to be. It's all it's it's it's, it's all about rattan fighting, heavy fighting, um, which it still very much is. It's the biggest spectacle of the year, um, and I feel that um, showcasing rapier prowess on Sunday, alongside, not separate, not separate from uh, rattan, is also a great way to build community between kingdoms and between disciplines as well, martially. Um, so. I think have I think the real the real gist of having more rapier than rattan is just kind of a balancing act for representation, which I think is fine. Um, Effingham, um, was about to, if I'm off base there, I apologize, but that's how I always saw it. No, I don't see it as off base, and I also see it as where the crowns are looking at this year. Her Majesty Mid uh, Runa was very enthusiastic about rapier. She had three champions for um, each of her disciplines, so wanted to really push that this year. Great. Uh, I know that in years past we've had some. Uh, uh, I won't speak to this year because I haven't talked to any of the four uh, principal crowns. Um, either set of their majesties, but uh, I know that in years past it has been uh, we have we have a couple of teams of armored fights that happened before that belts on belts, um, and then one set of rapier melee, uh, and so uh, it sort of washes out to over the course of Sunday roughly the same number of folks fielding from. Uh, armored sure. and rapier. Uh, it's not even, but it, it gets closer to uh, a good representation of each side. Um, Brendan, just a quick question. Sure. Before we jump into reviews, uh, I want to address something Valharic mentioned during his explanation of how he chooses a team. Um, and Because I, I think it's a really big culture difference between the East and the Mid. Um, Val, uh, you would... Like you had mentioned that you had that you had essentially slim pickings based on what you what they had grabbed for the melee, and you know with my knowledge of of, of mid realm prowess, which I feel is above the norm for an Easterner, um, I agree with you. Now the one main thing here is that ever since I've been playing, you we the East in at least in my time has had a hard no double dip rule on our end of things, um, whether or not it's in the rules or not. It's always been, at least from the Eastern Rattan standpoint, that if you're an unbelt and you run the melee, you don't get to run in the in the heroics mm. as well. That's just always kind of how it's been. Um, and then I that I'm only saying from Rattan, and that's that's just kind of you know, and both belt and unbelt. So that's always something that we've put forward and we've practiced for as long as I've been playing. You know, so it, it, it's it's cool to see that that's really not the case. Because I remember, like, sometimes people would be like, oh, look, they ran the same guy again. That's not right. I'm all like, I don't know what the rules are, <laughs> you know, because it varies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Depending. Generally, that's a negotiation point, and yeah. mm -hmm. it tends to, tends to like the double dip. Um, I know that I was, uh, I was fully, fully invested in fighting in the, the belted champions when I was told that I was commanding this and probably should fight in it as well. So um, fortunately, both of those things worked out well for us this year. But uh, but yeah, that's usually a negotiation point and, and we like to try to, to keep those options open. Cool. Yeah, it's just an interesting piece of, uh, of culture and anthropology I always, I always found interesting. I think that's really become more the norm over the last decade or so. Yep. Uh, I remember that uh, that once upon a time I fought uh, unbelts uh, and heroics uh, at this in the same year. So um, I think we're about eight nine pensix, uh, eight nine years into doing it that way. Uh, any last comments before we dive into some some review of video? So yes, I did have a comment on the uh, point that was
was just made about the different cultures. So um, we actually did have a last minute switch on Sunday because um, one of the cut and thrust combatants didn't identify to me that he was also on the heroic armored field. So uh, we had to make that switch and Thomas and I were able to negotiate a, a switch to make sure that everybody was following the rules. Awesome. Um, anybody else have anything before we dive into some video? Cool. All right. So uh, we're going to open with uh, the first fight of the day featuring our own Sir Arn. Uh, and uh, Arn, can you remind me who your opponent was? You're Arn, muted, can... buddy. That was Sir Killian. Thank you. And Killian's from where? The mid -row. Great. All right. So let's see what we got. Live television at its best, boys and girls. Let's see what we get. <laughs> uh, we do. All right. Is it okay if I talk through this? And there's yes, no audio please do. I so, would love your opinion. So I was, um, I'm aware of, I know who Sir Killian is. I know he was in, um, in the higher ends of the most recent crowns. So he was on my radar. Um, he seemed to me that he really wanted to throw that big right hand. And I was really convinced that I wanted to check him. So a lot of these shots that you're seeing, are checking shots. I wanted to make sure he, that he thought twice before getting over me. But then also, if he did decide to throw over them, that I was set up for a, a good counter. Um, so as you see here, I'm showing the point a lot. I wanted to make sure he didn't get comfortable or set at all. So I would put a couple just like that. I wanted to make sure that he didn't plant and get set as a, the no firing platform is what I wanted here. Um, and I was looking the whole time I'm looking for my leg. I'm looking for that leg that I missed there, right? So that was my whole that was my whole game plan. Um, was when I saw how he was setting up, how his shield positioning was. I almost hit this one, and he backed out just in time. We had a quick discussion here. I said it was no good. He agreed. Crowd claps. <laughs> I've watched it a few times, just a few times. So then I check him. I just barely got out of that and then here's my leg coming up and that's nice. all i want that's all i wanted the whole time all, all i wanted was that leg um because i like to sit people down so i don't have to worry about them standing up it's really quite simple um so i only fight leg opponents from maximum c range to b minus so when i set up here i wanted to just 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 to chip away make them uncomfortable he showed some really threatening point work a few times here. Um, also, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> That's why I got out as fast as I could. And then, um, but his shield positioning is really quite good. Um, I, I generally have very high on sides, and uh, he almost got me with that there. That was just a, a Jedi block, I would call that. That was just sheer, sheer luck at that point. That I didn't catch an offside leg. So that point work there was scaring me. Great block on the on the deep offside. I reset and then um, I hit the body thrust and hit the head. I was not convinced that the body thrust was good. Headshot right after it. Um, but good fight. Um, the matchup was. Um, I, I felt as if he never got set, and that was my whole goal because didn't. I felt like I felt to me that he really wanted to brawl. And I did want nothing to do with that. I right. wanted to like it. And it went well. That is awesome. It, I love, uh, and the, the comments are reflecting this, I love getting to hear what you're thinking as we're watching this fight. Um, so this was a, a case where, uh, Arn, you opened with yourself. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit of a, I wanted to set the tone i wanted to make a little bit of a statement that i'll you know i'm here to lead so i'm gonna go and lead you know um and uh it, it wasn't an easy decision to make uh, but i i wanted to see who they who they brought out for me and uh it was a good fight um 
And, uh, you know, it was it was our turn to choose who goes first, and damn it, I'm going to do it. So that's a, that's kind of how it was. Lead from the front. Awesome. Uh, Bahar, can you uh, – do you have anything you'd like to add about uh, why you're choosing, who you're choosing to respond to him? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, we had kind of had a, a gentleman's agreement to match nights with nights. Um he was, uh, he had a very successful crown tournament. Yeah. Uh, I like Killian a lot. I think that he needs to develop um, some more game in his high pressure fights. And I felt like this was an excellent opportunity where he, uh, where he could have been uh, very successful. Uh, I felt like they were, they were equally matched, but Arn did a really fantastic job of keeping him off his guard and, uh, and he never got to wade in the way that that he would have liked to into that fight. Uh, so it was it was good to watch. Um, I had hoped for a different outcome, but uh, no, it was. Um, I I think that that's super accurate. Like he was just watching his body language. He was waiting to get to jump on me, you know. And I and the only thing I could think to do was like, what can I do to make it so that there is. There's not a, that he has to think that there won't be as positive an outcome as he thinks there will be. You know, just keep him not comfortable is what I want to do. Got it. All right. Uh, so now we're going to jump into the second fight of the day. These uh, out for folks watching and for my esteemed panelists, uh, we are working off of. Uh, uh, boom, largely off of uh, Master Boomy's playlist from YouTube. Um, these are not always going to be in order. I'm trying to get them as close as I can, but uh, uh, our next fight up is going to be Antonio from the East and uh, Adam from the Middle in Rapier. Um, so, uh, Thomas and Lizabetta, can you talk me through uh, what what the pairing was, who who uh, who led and who answered. So in this case, they're both king's champions, so it was a done deal. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Uh, anything we should know before we watch this fight? All right, let's dive in. Gee, that took a while. Uh, yes, that was <laughs> quite a quick one. And I do attend Adam's local practice, and I know that he had been watching video ahead of the um, event and had been trying to find combatants that had similar fighting styles to Antonio to get ready for the day. But unfortunately, again, uh, well, we would have liked a different outcome. He did not prevail. Much right. to many people's chagrin, Antonio is kind of a monster who only fights the way that Antonio fights. Uh, there are not a lot of other fencing lefties that fight the way he does, and I was more than happy to let that roll out for our team the way it did. Cool. Uh, we have a request from my own squire in the comments to watch it one more time, and I will give them all four seconds of that. Uh <laughs> Here we go. So if you are looking at the final shot, what we have there is that Antonio was um, effective with his buckler in pushing off Adam's attempt to get him and then was able to bring the blade up and make the kill. Um, and we have from Antonio himself, uh, we came out in the same guard. He throws a body feint, juking forward a little. I lunged into the feint. Um, and that is from the man himself. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Um, our next fight, and I know this is out of order, uh, but uh, we're just going to run with it, is um, Ionis from the East and Deep Trick from Trimeris. I think this was actually our last fight of the day but it is the second in yeah, the last one the second in this stream so um as they are uh, going through anything uh Arn and valharic um 
Do you remember uh, who, who opened, who answered, et cetera? Um, so for what I recall, um, it was more, um, I actually don't remember who was, who was technically up. If it was the last one and I went first, then technically I think it was Bahar's pick, yeah? It was um, my pick, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was the last matchup. I saw that his Grace Dietrich was sitting over there the entire time. Uh, I knew someone was going to get him. Um, as Bahar mentioned before, we at Beer and Brats, we had a quick discussion like, hey, it's kind of customary for knights and knights, counts and counts, dukes and dukes, etc. You know, let's try to adhere that as best we can. Um, so we have Duke Ionis and we have Duke Dietrich. And uh, this is a fight that hasn't happened in probably close to a decade back when they were both on belts. Um, not 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 in this arena or field, but um, they haven't fought each other in close to a decade. Um, so there is uh, and and also generally speaking, Duke Dietrich is not as used to fighting someone with as big a shield or is that or is as tall as him. Um, is is one is one of the things that I considered when I saw the inevitable matchup. I go okay. Well, th this this can go well only because of a of a style difference, and it's also the very end of the day. It is the end of the day. There's a lot of aspects about that that don't get taken into consideration. I will say at this point, it was very very nice to know that the competition was over in my favor before yeah. <laughs> I had to call these individuals. Yeah. Uh, Dietrich has an incredible amount of talent and speed. And I would put him up against anybody in the list. And he was definitely a great choice for, for Ionis. For sure. For sure. Right. And with that, let's dive into this fight. So, Ionis so you have Ionis in black and Dietrich in the red and black. Yeah. Ionis misses the thrust there. Um, a lot of them just trying to get legs, trying to jockey a little bit trying to go around both your big shields. Uh, I watched this a ton. Dietrich was trying this rising thrust to go over the top of the shield. He tried it a few times. It's actually really cool to watch. I realized that both of them were fading out of each other's shots as they came to arms and legs. And that's the fight. Dietrich got the arm while Ionis went and got the head. In a similar exchange with Dietrich's shot landing lower on the body and, John, and um, Duke Ionis is landing on the head. Um, anything else before we dive into our third fight? No, I think we should carry on. Cool. Uh, our third fight uh, is, I believe, uh, John Drake of Trimeris versus, Osteora. I'm sorry, my mistake. Uh, John Drake of Onstiora uh, versus Cyrus of uh, Ethelmark. And John is in black here. Yep. So, Anything you want to share with us about this fight, the way you're thinking about it, uh, things we should watch for? So um, I would say with this pairing, it was also a last minute um, substitution. Uh, John Drake was not originally on the team and I don't recall, Thomas, do you know who was going to be fighting in his stead? Uh, no, Drake was. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I'm looking at like my notes from that one. These ones were just like our last two that we had as our pairings. So they were like one of the last ones we made. Um, I'm sorry, it was Jacques um, G who uh, was the yeah. last minute substitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Torse was supposed to initially be on the team and then JG uh, got a spot. Um, that's a different fight. These two- yep, Sorry for confusing it. <laughs> no, it. Yeah, oh no, it's two guys who both have ridiculously pretty fights and good form. It's the worst. Um, All right. <clears throat> I'm going to back this up and start from the opening exchange. Now, much like what Arn was saying in regards to some of these things, just a bit pregame about how people want to be the answer, but they don't always want to be the question. 
John Drake is one of those people that if I'm throwing his name out there, I do not mind him being the question. Um, as we go back to this for a second uh, and we come to the end of the fight, anything that you think folks should be watching as they're uh, watching this fight? Cool. Um, yeah, honestly, it's just one of those weird textbook pretty fights for fencers where people just play around at range until somebody terminates someone. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, still very much not in order. Uh, number four on this list is uh, our own uh, Valharic and Conrad of North Shield. Um, so he stands up real tall, which is great. He flattens his shield, which is great. He moves his arm around with no real threatening motion. And then he slowly steps right into my range and I stab him. I think that's the whole fight. Uh, as soon as I saw him, you'll watch him come up to a distance and then he'll close a little bit further. And I knew once he was closed, I didn't have to do anything, adjust anything, just throw the shot. All right. Let's see. Let's see it happen. Does creep in. There's a lot of face there. He has a lot of face. Boom. Let's watch it one more time. It's perfect. It is perfect. Um, so we have a, a question in the comments. Uh, what is meant by question and answer? Um, Anybody want to field this one? Sure. So when I went first to start the day, I I was, since I was the one putting myself out, I was the question. And it was up to do Faharik to then provide the answer to me as the question. So whenever whenever myself or Faharik or, or, or whomever is doing the, the doing the uh, the show that, that year, when you put someone out, when it's your turn to put someone out, that's you asking a question and then it's up to your counterpart to answer that question and that's the same thing on the rapier side only we're doing it on saturday night <laughs> yeah so that's what we mean when we say answer and question question and answer somebody's got to be thrown out there first yeah. and and in this case well yeah mm -hmm. all right so uh our next fight is going to be a rapier fight. It is Bosley from North Shield versus uh, Ulag of the Middle. Forgive me if I uh, um, get that wrong. Um, got it right. That's it. All right. Cool. Anybody remember who was the question, who was the answer, etc.? Anything? We should look for here. I believe in this case it was Ulig was the question. Is that what you recall, Thomas? I think so. Yes. Uh, and as we're watching this, who's who? Uh, yes, they're both red. So right. um, uh, Ulig is the one in all red, the red and uh, doublet red with pants. the white socks. Yes, white socks. Got it. Um, and yeah, I ended up going with. Uh, Bosley as an answer to this one because both of them are actually apparently at about the same height and same age bracket. Uh, so they're uh, I don't want them to be both mad at me, but they're kind of not spring chickens when it comes to some of this. Uh, and uh, it was really cool to actually see how both of their styles, in my opinion, were almost like a convergent evolution of each other's because they did not as far as I know... <laughs> Have fought each other before or knew each other before this. All right. Oh, and I would say that this was Ulick's first time on the champions team. Um, he is a, um, I believe he was made a bronze ring just before the pandemic, so he hasn't had a lot of opportunities to get out and show himself. So we were excited to bring him onto the team. I thought he got All his right. ring way before that, but that's pretty cool. 
And away we go. Darn Baldrick's. Right? I know. <laughs> now, is there an agreement in advance that they're both going to bring single, or did they just both choose that or talk they to them among themselves? They might have decided something amongst themselves, but like we have no part usually in what someone's bringing to the field. No, there are All a couple right. of cases where we facilitated matched um, pairings, but in this case, Ulick's preference, I, I know from regular fighting, is single sword. So he might have talked to Bosley, might not have, but it was a good pairing. All right. Cool. Uh, our next fight up is uh, is Ron Balder from the middle and Craven from Aitenvelt. Uh And I just want to shout out uh, Balharic. You, your intro for Rod Balder was fantastic. Do you remember what you said? No, I make all that shit up on the fly, man. Yeah, dude. It, it was something along the lines of with, with, uh, in the shadows around campfires when names are whispered, <laughs> that name is Rod Balder or something like that. And I was watching this and I was so I, – I mean, I'm excited to watch these two fight anyone let alone one another but i was so pumped after that intro well done sir thank you and i would say that we also wanted ron Boulder on the heroic rapier team but the rule <laughs> prevented us from doing it seeing him on both fields um anybody remember who is uh who yeah. put out first here uh, i believe vahark i believe you put out ron Boulder. i believe so yes and i had had a, I. i I had been in contact with Craven for about a month prior to war, just getting to know him a little bit. Uh, I know he's no stranger to the heroic field. Um, and I had gone into uh, Sunday with the personal attempt to not, to not do any recent refights. And the wrong ball, the Craven fight was like five years ago. Um, so to me, that doesn't count. <laughs> and I had, I had that discussion with him. He was more than happy to take the fight. If it came to it, it came to it. Uh, and this is what happened. Uh, well, these are, and, go ahead. These are two of my very favorite people in this society. Oh, 100%. These are, it's hard to find two nicer guys in the same field at the same time. 100%. Heroes on a field of heroes. 100%. Um, and uh, if memory serves for those watching, this is uh, a lefty on lefty fight. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's worth noting. Uh, Ron Valder is in white. Craven is in black as we watch this. So we, we open with a lot of uh, just tension in, uh, in range and mm -hmm. seeing who's going to respond to what in footwork. As we are all just mesmerized by the greats doing yeah. their thing. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of jockeying, and the exchange is coming pretty shortly. Yeah, and there's the leg. Craven had been legged five years ago too. Um, there's, you know, there's something special about Rumbo's ability to shut down other lefties, especially ones that are his size. Um, you know, both he and Craven are not large, tall men, um, but uh, his grace, Ron Balder, just did what he had to do. I see. Yep. Mm. 
And there it is. Yep. Excellently fought. Excellently fought. All right. Um, I think, let's see, what do we have up for our next fight? Uh, our next fight up is uh, is on the rapier field. We have Niccolo from Meridies and Mirabai from uh, the middle. And again, um, that was um, Mirabai was being presented as the question. Yep. I did not know a whole lot about Niccolo, but I had just met him that day, and uh, I liked the idea that he wasn't going to be somebody who was like a foot and a half taller than Mirabai, um, So, because I wanted it to be a much more like even on the ground sort of fight and not so much just, I was hoping that it wasn't going to become an out of range slugfest. This is a uh, one of our longer fights of the day, so yes. let's yeah, it let's was. strap in, kids. <clears throat> I welcome any education the two of you would like to give me as a. Uh, I would I would like to claim mediocre fencer. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, I am not that good. So anything you notice that uh, we should be watching for, I'd appreciate. It's interesting to see this one from this angle because I was on the other side of this fight game day of. Uh, yeah, I was watching this from between the red and black and blue and white banners in the on the right side of the screen. So this is a fun angle for me as well. Yes, and they're both being very cautious and... Um, yeah, using it was, similar guards and parries. <laughs> yeah, it was way more patient than I kind of expected, to be Me perfectly too. honest. Um, but even when they're going in, they're not really committing. Like a lot of these are just really extended and exaggerated feints. Like nobody's really committing to anything in this fight. And it was Mirabai's first time on Champions, as, or Heroic Champions as well. I don't know about Niccolo. Is this his first time? I'm not entirely sure. I feel like it might have been, because I think he... I could be entirely wrong, but I think someone had told me that he had only recently been given uh, the uh, Meridian Order of the Blade. But yeah, as my grand cadet says in the comments, they both did dial in each other's range pretty quick. They didn't have to like toy around with it. They seemed pretty cued in on who was where and what their measure was going to actually be. Which then leads to a lot of this. <laughs> And commentary in terms of me mentioning that a few people uh, have been the first time on the team. We lost some of our heavy hitters over the pandemic, not to death or anything, but just um, choosing other things. Oh. No, putting together the team this year definitely was an interesting challenge of like, you know, who's actually going to Penzik versus who's, you know, going in any reasonable condition to be fighting at Penzik. I'm sorry, I was talking over that as they were recently. All right, I I have a question here for yep. uh, why uh, can somebody talk to me about why the fight is being moved? Is this an is this a rapier norm? It does tend to be a norm when the fight um, is getting too close to the um, edge of the world, the list ropes. Uh, we will reset and move it over if there's an expectation that the fighters are going to continue pushing the boundaries. Okay, because yeah. I watching, I remember watching this fight, thinking to myself, if I'm uh, 
if I'm the gentleman from Meridius who name, whose name escapes me, I put her in the corner because that's where I wanted her. And that is an interesting cultural difference, I believe, that I'm not entirely sure why we do it that way. It just has been uh, maybe a safety measure. Okay. No, there's a lot of us here in the East who, uh, if somebody puts someone in a corner, they're usually trying to maintain that advantage. It was kind of a surprise to me, too. Um, but then again, usually I'm the one who gets put in a corner because I'm the one who retreats in my experience. Uh, All right, so I'm going to yeah. stop us here and let us uh, watch the explosion at the end. Uh, and uh, if you walk me through what happens here now that we've watched couple minutes of uh, measure. So this actually does still line up with what I saw on the day of, which was Mirabai throwing a shot that he then parried off to the outside. Uh, he threw a shot at her while he was trying to close. He missed her head, but then went for one of those pulling draw cuts as he was continuing to close. I don't think he expected her to stand her ground there, which is why I think he kept going. Mm -hmm. um, because up until then, she had been backing out of measure pretty consistently. But ultimately, that was kind of what ended the fight. And I think they had some discussion about, you know, the draw cut versus what was or wasn't missed, or if anything was missed. Right. And as you can see, um, Mirabai was positioned for a draw cut, but I don't believe that it, she was able to get enough of a draw there for it to have yeah. ended up being a double. Great. Because sadly, if you're moving towards someone while you're trying to also pull in that same direction, it doesn't always go the way you'd like. All right. Anything else on this fight before we jump to the next? <laughs> All right. We have an armored fight. Uh, now we have uh, Sven from uh, Drakenbald slash Ethelmark. Uh, and uh, can somebody remind me the uh, yes. knight's name from Atlantia? Yes. Thank you. All right. Ashton has an incredible amount of speed. Yes. Um, he's As hard to handle. And, yeah. uh, and Sven, you know, is is deadly accurate. Um, I was hoping the whole time that he'd land that. Yep. That I, have, um, I have some Sven experience uh, but, but, but when he was in Kingdom and Ethelmark. Um, I got to fight him a bunch of times in tournament and out. And um, Afshin, I mean, uh, the, I was, I, I didn't know the gentleman until that morning of. Um, I'm happy to get to know him um, even more, but uh, definitely impressive speed and aggression, as we'll see here. He just does not let Sven get set with his, and there it is. Uh, he he went right to, he wanted nothing to do with Sven being able to play pokey pokey, uh, which he's very, very good at with that offhanded, um, if you want to call it a, a spear, a broken lance or a short spear. He's exceptional at finding um, that thrust. And uh, Afshin went right for that side. He didn't go hard offside. He went straight for that, and he just put the pressure there until he was. This happened. All right. Um, next up, we have. Let's see. Number nine. Uh, this is Cassius uh, of the East versus uh, Matthias of the Middle. Is that right? No, um, Matthias is from Ethelmark. Great. Thank you. So this is interesting to me in that it's one of the first fights I've noticed where the, on the rapier side, where the forms did not match. It was case versus dagger here. Yep. 
Uh, in terms of matchups with weapons, uh, we don't see case coming out in a tournament fight as often as you might see it on the melee field. So that's probably why you haven't seen it as much during the fights that we've watched so far. And rapier and dagger is probably the most common form you'll see. All right. Uh, next up, you have... Uh, we have Boomy from Atlantia versus Davius from Trimeris. Uh, Davius is in the white shirt. Boomy's in the black doublet. Yep. And this pairing was an expectation of them having a great fight. Yeah. No, like, this is straight up just two friends who have phenomenal talent and skill that uh, when we threw this one out, we had no worries about there being any sort of chicanery or question about what happens. They were going to have fun, and it was going to be ridiculous and entertaining. And I love in this one that we see a lot of movement where we haven't necessarily seen as much in the other fights. On the rewatch, it's actually kind of interesting to see how much less Davius is moving than usual. <laughs> New father, so... Uh, yeah, He's there's tired, that. man. He's tired. <laughs> that baby no. takes it out of you. To his credit, I think he also drove straight through the night and literally got there just before the fights today. It was bonkers. That is accurate. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I can barely walk across the field without feeling like I need to take a nap anyway, and he's got new baby and driving all through the night. That's... Oh. And that's why I used to put a belt loop in my armpit, then I had to wear a henchman scarf. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and burn through a couple of these uh, so that we can maybe get through all of these. Uh, we're not going to, but uh, see what we can do. Uh, next up, we have part. This is part of uh, the fight, this fight. Yeah, this is part um, two. Is this Luther and Axgar? Yes. Yeah. So uh, Luther's in black, Axgar's yeah. in green and yellow. Luther is an unbelt, uh, formerly of the East, now residing and fighting out of Vatenvelt. And uh, Axgar is from the Outlands. Uh, and my recollection here is that Luther had lost, had lost an arm, uh, tripped and got hit in the arm on the way down. And then, yes. uh, and now here we are. And Axgar did him the courtesy of, uh, of dropping his offhand. It was the leg, and oh. he, yeah, he, he took the head on the way down. All right. Um, let's go to number 12. This is Yehuda of the East versus Titus of the Middle. Yep. Anybody remember who is uh, the question and the response? In this case... I believe it was Yehuda was the question. Is that your recollection? Yes. Right. And um, similar size, um, similar weapon style. Yep. If anybody can see anything and walk us through it, uh, I mostly end up seeing Yehuda's back when I watch this. Yeah, I was on the other side of this when it went down. Yehuda just opened up on something and then took too wide of a stance and Titus made him eat it. Uh, it was very well done on Titus's part. Um. All right. Now we have uh, Remy from the East 
and yep. Maximilian from the middle. Remy is in blue. Maximilian is in many colors. <laughs> and yeah. so in this case, uh, Remy was the question and Max was the answer. And everyone is shocked at why would we do this? But I thought it would be a really fun fight to see the um, contrast of sizes. And Remy had proposed bringing out um, Spear. And this is the first time we have um, highlighted Spear in a champion's battle. Um, yeah. So we were excited to do this. And then Remy is still yeah. doing shots. <laughs> um, my recollection is that there is uh, a shot to uh, Max's throat that just gets held there, and that's what the crowd responds to. Though mm -hmm. you don't yep. see it through. Unfortunately, uh, from that angle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. All right. That was cool to watch, though. I remember it. All right. Now we have an armored fight, which is. Uh, Douglas from the East versus Maynard from Ethelmark. This is a this is a fight that's happened before. Um, we um, and that's the end of it right there. Actually, so that's part two. Um, part All one right. was there was a part one that. Uh, there we one. go. Part one. They're out Here. of order. Sorry. So Doug has a good advance there. Um, Doug's no stranger to this fight. Doug has had this fight at Ice Dragon a few times. Um, at Penzik last time in this arena as well. Um, I believe that Doug was the question and Maynard was the answer. Um, and so we had this fight again. And then uh, I think Doug did a really good job here. Great slip, great block, missed it. That was it, and he didn't get it. And then his elbow cop comes off right here, and he lost his momentum. And then we go to the close of the fight. Yep. Doug is and, the one in the gray and gold. I just saw yeah. somebody was asking. Yeah, and Maynard is in the black and gold. Yeah. Doug has two swords. Maynard has the pole. And Sir Douglas Henry, um, he's a mainstay, heroic champion. Um, and uh, I, I love that man to death. He is a, a dear, dear friend. You know, and Maynard is, is top-notch uh, against, against anyone. He is... Uh, as long as I have the opportunity to field him as a heroic, I always will. He's uh, he's one of my heroes, and he he always brings the fight. The moment that Ethelmark declared for the mid, I'm like, okay, who's taking the Maynard fight? And I had some other ideas for the Maynard fight. I had other people for the Maynard fight, but that didn't happen. And uh, just not how that that's not how this Sunday of War Week gods wanted it to go. And um, great fight again. Doug had a great jump on him. Great block, great slip, just missed it, lost his elbow cop, lost the momentum, and then here is where uh, his remainder puts him down with that perfect thrust. All right. Uh, next up we have, uh, if I have this right, we have Kyrgyzstan of Eldermere and Michelangelo. I don't have a kingdom. Oh, he is from the middle. All right. Okay. And this was um, the last pairing that um, Thomas and I put together. Um, yeah. So he was the last name I had on my list. And I don't know. <laughs> Thomas had a few people he was moving around. But. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think I had initially slated her for fighting somebody else. And then uh, that was when Her Highness from Eldermere had a uh, request about who her fight was and that was when we got yeah that thankfully it all resolved itself uh all right um next up we have uh ava from the east and sibylla from trimeris yep uh ava is in the red and white and this one was the specifically requested fight. Ava wanted Sibylla, and um, there was discussion over um, how to make that happen. Yeah, I was going to say, so I thought I dropped Ava on that one. I think Ava was the question for this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because 
on our part, it was going by between um, Sibylla and Her Majesty Trimaris as to right. who we were going to fill for that spot. All right. So uh, anybody remember what the conversation here is? Uh, there was some conversation about whether or not an arm shot was valid or if it was to the body. There was some discussion. They ended up uh, recentering. Um, this is another one of those fights that took a little longer. Um, and I'm sure some of the armored guys are going to be a little confused because there is a point where one of the fighters takes... Uh, Ava took Sibylla's arm and then when they reset, they reset from scratch. Uh, whereas a bunch of people that day of were like, why is somebody giving up an earned advantage? Um, Got it. But, uh, All right. I th think this is the reset. All right, so it uh, looks like it's an arm for a kill uh, trade there. Yep. Um, let's see. Next up, if my notes are correct, we have uh, Cassian from the east and Charles from the middle. Uh, Charles obviously in the pale, Cassian in the black and red. Brendan, quick pause. And just reset that if you can, because it's actually it's a fast fight. Um, Cassian was our representative from the east of the three unbelts. Um, Cassian is my squire. Uh, worked exceptionally hard uh, to get where he is today. He was in the crown finals with His Majesty Ryu. Um, he and I have been, uh, and I personally know Charles well enough. I was better than most Easterners do in regard to his martial ability. And uh, I had been telling my three guys, like, hey, there's a guy. His name is Charles. He's really good. And you're gonna have to be really good to beat him. And uh, I actually, so you can press play, Brennan. I appreciate it. Thank you for the pause. Um, Cassian came out of the gun here, throwing hard, hard check shots, top leg. Again here, miss, miss. Good pickups there. He picked up that because Charles has such a fast offside body. Yeah. Cassian barely picked that up. And here is where there's a small check to the arm that Cassian picks up after that exchange. Small check, and then this Molinay to the head, bang. And small discussion here. Cassian thought he got some shield on it. They had a quick conversation. He took the take. You die when you're dead. And, um, and uh, it's... That fight was not going to be long and drawn out. <laughs> and uh, at that point, um, Charles was the question. Cassian was the answer. All right. Uh, was next really, up. Oh, sorry. I was really Please. confident leading Charles um, against against anybody in the in the unbelted stable on the eastern side. Uh, he's just he's just an incredible technical fighter, and uh, and he did what what he does. Yep. He executed very well. And again, I would, I would, I would still put, I would, if I were casting or if, if I were me all over again, I would take the same fight. I would, hmm. I would, I would do the same thing. I really would uh, because that's just how I feel about it. And Charles is great and deserves uh, a great fighter. All right. Uh, now we have, uh, a rapier fight, which is Devlin from the east and Trap from the middle. Uh, Devlin is in the black pants. Trap is in the beige pants. And Trap has the giant was, feather Trap on his head. Question. Yes, Trap has the giant feather. Um, yep. So Trap was the question. Devlin was the answer. And I believe that this was a um, refight of the two of them. They've come yeah. across each other in heroics before. So Thomas, did you have any other reasons to put the two of them together? Uh, Devlin um, was kind of chomping at the bit. I was actually... Um, I had a little bit of reservation, but Devlin, uh, he pulls it out. Because um, I think the last time that they went up against each other, Devlin took the L. Um, they're very closely matched. They both have really good distance, timing, 
and footwork. Uh, and on that one, shocking most of us, Devlin actually used his dagger as something other than an ornament. <laughs> All right. And I'm sure uh, Trap wasn't expecting that either. <laughs> I wouldn't have. <laughs> uh, and uh, next up we have uh, Inyeshka from the East and Nobu from the Outlands. Uh, Nobu, I'm sorry? Oh, continue, yes. Uh, next, uh, I'm sorry, Nobu is in the all black on the left side of the screen. All right, and this was a unique one because Nobu is a 15-year-old who is authorized as an adult. So we were very cautious about how we were making this pairing to make sure that it was reasonably fair for both sides. Yeah, and Anechka is one of our fighters who um, has been in the SCA fighting for less than a year, but has been taking with class has been taking classes with Remy. Um, so this was one of those fights that like. I felt was about as like fair as we could gel it given like the awkward circumstances of it. And I thought it came out as you'll see a really good closely matched fight that, you know, pushed them both a little out of their boundaries and gave them both some, you know, high intensity showtime, which I was delighted to see for both of them. Yeah, Nobu hate. is a um, child of two mods, so he has some experience coming into this. Yeah, on that one, his thrusting tip got caught behind Aneshka's guard, so as he was trying to pull his sword back, it was wedged in between her, like, Kians and the guard there. That wasn't, like, any sort of, you know, questionable stuff that just sometimes happens. And I still hate how pretty her form is. <laughs> It's so damn pretty. It she is. Was beautiful in that fight. Go figure if you, uh, you know, take lessons from the get-go. You don't have to unlearn bad habits to then relearn good ones. It's shocking. Bordering <laughs> on not fair. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we have uh, Kenrick uh, from the West, uh, His Majesty Kenrick, and uh, Edmund from the Middle. Edmund is in the purple pants with the feather. Uh, Kenrick's on the left side of the screen in the yellow with the black pants. I had originally planned for Edmund to fight Doug Henry, but uh, when I saw His Majesty come out with two sword, I thought that, that this was a, was a great response to it. I agree. Um, I think that this, I, and we're going to see some of the brilliance of Edmund's ability to avoid shots and bleed them in just a minute here. Um, just by, just by really well zone blocking his enormous swords that he has and taking, and taking so much power off them because um, the, when he comes in to try and close right here and, and gets tangled up, Edmund just finds his way to get his swords just where they need to be to not die. And, and it's, and it's really, it was, it was, it was an impressive hang and bang um, as you, as you want to call it until he found his, uh, his shot there. Can one of you answer this question we have in chat? Uh, the opponents are, are mostly, um, mostly fighting with what they brought, what they feel their best is. Yep. Um, sometimes we might match weapons, uh, or sometimes we might choose to, to mismatch weapons depending on what we feel, uh, totally. fighters individual strength is. Yeah. So there's no actual declaration. Um, so when Valharic and I are having a discussion, I'm not saying, you know, and it, and it, and it's my turn to throw somebody out. I'm not saying, Hey, I want to throw out so-and-so from, from the East. He fights sword and shield. You know, that's not in the conversation. And a lot of the time we already know for the most part, who we're talking about, um, unless it's an ally, you know. But at the end of the day, we're not declaring what what weapons form our combatants bringing. Same for uh, rapier. We were looking yeah. at what people usually bring, and they brought their best. Yep. Fun side note about this particular fight for the rattan side. Uh, I saw Edmund walking in his armor with those two swords, and I didn't actually get to see the hilts on him. And I thought he was gearing up for a rapier heroic <laughs> champions fight because he also fights with yep. similarly sized rapiers in that. And I was about to be like, holy crap, did I miss a substitution? I thought I had screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, 
think it was a great call. Um, it was it was a great call to make that match, Valharic, and uh, good fight. Um, it showcased it showcased Duke Edmonds' ability to to survive in a tough situation and and eke out the win. Great. Um, next up, we have uh, let's see, we have William from the East uh, versus Ish. I, is that how you say it uh, from the middle? Yes, Ish. I oh, mm -hmm. that's Doctor Will Death. Yeah, Will Death versus Ish to Ish of Shino de los Indios, and this is a contrast uh, fight. So, um, Thomas and I. Um, quickly matched up the three cotton dress fights that we had at the beginning. So I'm not even sure who was the question, who was the answer. We just put them together. Um, I, I, Will remember, Death wanted this one. I remember each being the question because Will Death was like, yes, I want this. I want this. Please give me this. He was hyped for it. He was. <laughs> I do remember the hype. <laughs> Uh, Will is in the green. Uh, Ish is in uh, the animal print on the right. I was going to say, I hope they get a better, like, closer view of this, because this was so good. Ish did really, really well on this. And you don't see case as a form used in cut and thrust very often, let alone two people in the same match using case in a cut and thrust fight is extremely rare. Uh, and these two are both just top tier, so it was really well matched and really well done. And I believe this is a two-parter, so to see the end, you'll have to go to the second video. There's a lot of measuring going on early in this fight, I yeah. recall. So we are, let's see, about a minute in and not much action. They're just taking the measure of each other. Yeah. Will Death is one of the most patient people in the world. Now, hopefully this is queued up right. Yep. Now yeah, we, we go, go to a different angle of the second half of this fight. I'm going to pause this for a moment. Um, it, this is, uh, we miss Will taking Isha's leg uh, yes. in the transition between the two. Um, and I think there and, was some discussion because there are some groups out there that uh, a leg shot for cut and thrust is a kill. And they both, I think, specifically were like, now nah, we got to finish this. <laughs> yes, I believe that was the extent of the conversation. <laughs> All right. And he got one right in on Will as Will was trying to throw both of his shots, and it was so well done. Yeah, the Will video stepped doesn't to do it a little justice. bit too much and overcommitted yeah. to that. Mm hmm. Like, sadly, the video just doesn't do it justice. Being there in person on that day was so, it was, it was aces. It was a beautiful response by Ish. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have names for this one. So if y'all do, I, I would welcome your help. That is Rolla de Salain in the silver. Um, I believe. Um. No, maybe not. No, that's a white scarf. So no, that's not. I'm sorry. I'm, since it's not in order, I don't have the names as well. Oh, I think. Fair enough. 
I think this one is JG. Uh, is that Jacques Gantz and the white scarf in the like greenish doublet? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then um, Robert McEwen is the Apple yes. Martian. Mm-hmm. Yes. And he is Queen's Rapier champion for Apple Mark. Um, I notice uh, that they both elected single. I love when that happens. Yeah. That was so slick right there. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even. Uh, Jacques what are we from? What so, are we looking for here? Uh, uh, when he when JG steps around Robert, he literally is throwing his sword around behind his head to pick up the other guy's blade to make sure he can't hit him with it. Uh, right there, well, you'll right see there. him whip his sword around over his head. It was, it was so slick. Oh. That was right. a beautiful ending where he held it there to yeah. stick that landing. Sometimes you so gotta we, stick the landing. <laughs> we are coming up on uh, our normal end time. Uh, if everybody's willing, I'd like to run a little bit late because we're getting close to getting all the way through the day. So if you can stick with me, uh, uh, my esteemed guests and audience, uh, I'd appreciate it. So esteemed. So esteemed. Incredibly esteemed. Um, All right. Uh, Let's see. I think we are on to... Hugo. Hugo, yeah, so this is Hugo 1 right here. So um, quick pause. Uh, And and this is... I'm sorry? Uh, Bjarki. Bjarki, yep. From Athamark. Um. Hugo is, uh, well, uh, at this time, now Sir Hugo. Um, uh, Hugo had probably one of the best seasons an Umbel can have in Atlantia. Um, I've been friends. I've counted him as, uh, as an equal marshally for a long time. He, um, he's the only person to beat me in heroics in 2017. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to do this for him because he's had, if you have the, if you have the season that you have, damn it, you deserve a cherry on top. Um, and, uh, I was following his exploits all year, talking to Atlanteans all year. He was on, he was the first unbelt on my list with the second that Atlantia declared. Um, so I was, I was happy to have him and you'll see why. All right. He's very aggressive. Did a good job picking that up. And then he comes in and just starts hammering. He hits very, very hard all the time. And he, and then he got that arm right there. I at first didn't see it, but uh, in the last piece of that exchange, he did get, I think, an inside arm is why a lot of people missed it. Inside sword arm. Yeah, it came back across the body yep. uh, to, to get that arm. Yep. Yeah, it was unpleasant. Oh, look, me. And to finish up. Yep. Oof. All right. Um, let's see. My, if I am right, we next have... Uh, Let's see. Sorry. That's uh, Hugo and Sparky again. This is uh, Donovan from the east in the black and white and Usted from the middle. This is a cut and thrust bout. I love Usted. He is one of my favorite humans. And this is one that we had to arrange a substitution, um, and we were excited to get Ustad on the team for uh, Cotton Thrust Bout. Um, 
the um, individuals originally slated for that position um, had, um, I believe, an ankle issue. He mentioned that this is his first time as a uh, as a Raker heroic, and he was super stoked for it. Yeah, no, he was very excited, and uh, he did real well. Um, Donovan, unfortunately, is you know one of our. He's well, Donovan. Donovan is Donovan. He's very Donovan. Extraordinarily <laughs> um, Donovan. Um, and Donovan, Donovan is in the chat for us. Uh, Yay. I was setting up extended just to try and see if, if I'd flush a reaction at a super wide measure. My guard changed when there wasn't anything I could use and I closed measure somewhat. I threw out the foot shot just because I didn't like that. He was starting to set up where he looked comfortable. Same with the hand shots and with a potential bonus, maybe hitting something. I was pretty much planning from the get-go to use my thrusting range against his cutting range. I hit him on his way in, and it uh, cuts off there. Um, great. Thank you, David, for walking us through your thoughts. I appreciate yeah, it. Man. Um, let's see. What do we have next? I don't have names uh, for our next fight. Um so on the middle side with the party colored pants, that is um, Raphael de Marisi. Yep. And on our side, that's uh, Gerhard von Hohensee. He's one of our newer ogres. Um, I think actually he just got his ogre at Isles of March, one of our first events back in person. Uh, Gerhard's on the left in the black, correct? Yes, black with the yellow hood. Super. And uh, give me the name from the mid middle one more time. Please. Raphael. Great. Also um, known, he's as known as R2. R2 in the fencing community. <laughs> All right. There was another Raphael before him. He was the second one, therefore. You might want to fast forward a little bit through this one because they stay at range for a long time. I remembered this uh, being. Oh, long. this is the second half of the. Okay. This is the second okay. half of the fight. Okay. Um, Go for it. So in the, what we have here. Mm -hmm. yep, uh, yes, this was the first half of the fight, and it's about five minutes long. Yeah, it, and so much of it is just completely out of measure for all of it. You feel free to get to the second part because, yeah, uh, that right. is where most of the action happens. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that's really interesting uh, came in. Uh, so this is for uh, Thomas and Lizabetta. We hear we're hearing a lot of comments about uh, matching belt, belted and unbelted fighters on the armored side. Uh, but for rapier, the analog doesn't seem to be as much of the calculation. Do y'all um, do y'all make a point of doing that match or not? Uh, not necessarily. Um, we were looking at um, similar um, fight styles, um, what would make a good pairing, but um, in terms of consideration of mod or scarf, I don't, I didn't take it particularly into consideration. Yeah, honestly, from my side of things, uh, I still feel like, uh, as far as heroics goes, the delineation between mods and those who are not yet mods or anything like that. Uh, I don't feel like there's enough masters of defense really that it's to the degree that we have that separation like you guys have with belts versus unbelts. Uh, I'm way more worried about whether or not somebody can show up and throw stick on somebody. What your decorations are, I really don't care as long as you're there to like, you know, put stick on the other guy for King and Kingdom. Awesome. Um... Let's see. Uh, I seem to have... Bear with me a second while I play catch up on YouTube. Um, That's fine. I could give some commentary on the matchups as well. Um, one of the negotiated points was that we could have... Um, at, um, it had to be... Um, was it no more than five or was it at, at least, least five? At least five... Uh, had to be non-mods. At least yes. five had to be 
eating odd mods. That was what it was. Which yeah. right now is still a super easy metric to just it hit. Was. It wasn't. Uh, most of ours were non mods. Um, my, yeah. We had a few um, knights and royal peers in there, but. Yeah. So did we. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think I'm caught up. Let's do. Uh, we're going to have uh, this fight is armored. We have uh, Yan from the east. And can somebody help me with a name? Bjarn? Bjarn, right? Uh, with an M. I think. Oh, with an M. B R M with an M. Yeah, this is Sir Jan. Um, Sir Jan is the knight that, that I served when I was a squire. Uh, I consider him to have some of the most, uh, some of basically the best um, fundamentals out there right now. Um, and uh, this is what he showed. And this is, it's his second time out there. In He's in the to blue him. and yellow also. Yep. Bjarm is in the uh, purple and gold hood. John throws a bomb right here to check him. Again, BR misses the leg coming in. You can tell it was shallow. Jan sinks his. Same thing, boom, and kills him here with the belly shot, I believe, right there. And then Jan, yeah, exactly. It was the cut to the belly. I think, uh, I think Jan is a is a great, great choice for this fight. I think he's a great choice to to have as as a member of the chivalry on the heroics team. He's very very solid. Uh, I I think he's. I will. I will right make there. sure. I'll I did sure not know, know anything about the arm, other than yeah. he had his Majesty's confidence and so, he, um, he fitted himself well. Uh, Sir Jan, Sir Jan is the kind of is exactly the kind of person I want to have for this, uh, for a matchup where, you know, and no disrespect to Sir Bjarm, but he's not a name that either of us recognize. Is that fair to say? And that's not to disparage him at all. But at the end of the day, um, if you're someone that's coming to the field with a, with a, a center grip and a sword, Jan knows a thing or two about fighting a, a guy with a center grip and a sword. You know what I mean? You know, he's got a, <laughs> he's got a squire that does it and a grand squire that does it. Um, so he, um, he was prepared. He's, he's, uh, he's one of the most stoic and mentally, uh, uh, uh mentally, uh, fortified men I know when it comes to high stress environments like this. And that's why I'm going to, if it's, if it continues to, if I continue to have a say in it and he, it, and he continues to win, he belongs there. All right. I'm actually Come. really surprised. You said that's his second time in heroics. Yes, so he his first time in Heroic Champions, he uh, was matched with uh, Duke Kellick, in which he won, uh, and mm -hmm. that was uh, and that was in that was in Penzik, you know, back in in 2019. It, uh, but he has ran on the melee a few times, but he has mm -hmm. always wanted to be a Heroic Champion. He got his chance uh, back in 2019, absolutely killed it. That's why he's back here this year. I mostly, I'm not going to lie, I mostly remember Brennan's introduction of him from that heroic fight because it was Aces. Oh, yeah. I, when you say his I, full, exceedingly Polish name, you got to say it really loud and long and drawn out. <laughs> Jan Janowicz Bogdanski! <laughs> Big time. Uh, but, thank right. you for your kind, but th thank you, Grace, for your kind words. Um, next up, we have uh, Murin from the East, and I don't have a name of the opponent. And this here. is Roland de Slane. The silver is yep. what got me earlier. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, Murin is on the right in the striped pants. Other fun facts Murin doesn't know she's about to get an ogre after this. <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> She snuck that in super well. Uh, mm -hmm. It was smooth like butter. She didn't actually like... Oh, 
Sorry, I just saw from Natavia that apparently we snatched her right out of her Rose team. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yes, Roland was doing a good job of controlling measures throughout the fight, but I uh, just didn't see it coming. <laughs> yeah. It was a All great right. deception on her part. This is the BRP fight again. Yep. Sorry, just uh, getting through these. And let's see. Uh, we have Katarina's fight. Where is that? So this it's one tough. is one of the three um, Queen's champions for Runa. Um, this is Gregory Bryant, and he doesn't know that he's going to get a bronze ring the next day. Um, and uh, because there were three Queen's champions, there was actually a decision-making process here. The other two Queen's champions were myself and Gwyneth Verguin, who was recently made a mod. So we wanted to give Gregory an opportunity to showcase himself in this fight. All right. Mm -hmm. So Gregory is on the left in the wine color with the red ball trick. Yep. And Katarina is our Queen's champion. Um, she was also one of my deputies helping pick and like do the pairings for the team this year too. Her and Will Death were my uh, right and left hands for this process and I could not have done it without them. And I actually talked to Gregory after this fight and he said that she was doing an amazing job, that she just made one mistake there that he was able to take that advantage of and step in and get the kill. Hmm. All right. Um, we have one other fight that isn't on YouTube. This is uh, Count Barrick versus Count Steiner. Count Barrick of the Outlands yep. and Count Steiner of Eldermere. Uh, uh, Barrick's on the right in, uh, with the Diamond Shield We can and his back to us. And before you start, um, I had sniffed out the Barrick situation, Count Barrick, I believe, right? By uh, your grace? Yes. I, um, I, I had so. sniffed. I'm sorry. There's two your graces here. I apologize. <laughs> um, the uh, at, Beers, at Beer and Bratz, he was in the Outland King's retinue. I saw him. I didn't know who he was. I saw a white belt on. I found out who he was. I found out that he just stepped down. I go, hmm, sounds like a guy who's going to field tomorrow. Um, was able to pull a little bit of video, and I, I actually like the Steiner matchup. I would, I would probably fight it again, honestly. Um, I, I run that one back. To be I thought, I thought it was a great match. It's, yeah. it's probably my favorite fight of the of the set. Uh, I knew going to war that I was going to have um, have Barrick fight. He is, cool. he's a beast. Yeah, uh, no, for sure. I've gotten to fight him uh, a few times, and he's his hand speed, uh, everything. And then I thought, you know, some people might be thrown by fighting um, fighting Steiner yep. and his anterior style. And I thought yep. that that this would be a good matchup, and and it was. It did not disappoint. No, I think it was. I think it was great. Steiner got out of some tricky situations. Uh, it's it's a fat. It's a it's a. Uh, you can press play, Brennan. I'm sorry for chatting. Um, no, no, this is great. But uh, Sarna gets out of some sticky situations again. Um, when you, because you threw out Barrick, and then we had Count Steiner, and uh, again, you know, aggressive on both fronts. Steiner survives. Steiner survives, and then Steiner has a good idea coming up. Right there, he had a good idea, but Barrick threw into threw into. Um, if you want to just kind of bring that back a little bit. Um, Steiner goes for an offside to take Barrick's arm and Barrick throws in between it, right? Boom, right there. And he's dead. And it was really just the timing and placement was, was, was excellent because even if that arm shot lands, it's a bad trade situation. You know what I mean? Um, sure. So I think that that was a, a really skillful shot selection. Uh, and Steiner's no, A, I mean, A, he's Count Steiner. B, he's no stranger to heroic feel at all. So he's, I mean, he, he beat Craven in 2019. That's why he was also on my list, you know? Um, so there's things to consider there, but I think that was a phenomenal fight just to echo what the said. Awesome. 
Um, those are all the fights we, I think we've run through all of them. Uh, and I just want to start by saying thank you to uh, my guests for uh, staying with us tonight and sharing your insights. Uh, this has been super fun for me. Uh, this is my this is my favorite part of Penzik is watching heroics, both the armored and the rapier. So having the four of you here tonight to share uh, your th thinking and show us behind the curtain is super fun. Um, Baharik, Arn, Lizabetta, Thomas, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Yep. Thanks for having uh, us. This was great. Absolutely. Next it was week a pleasure we... working with you guys the whole war, honestly. I hope, you did. I hope to do it again. It Y'all did a great job. Absolutely. Uh, next week, uh, coming up on Coach's Corner, we have Meridier's Heroes and Traditions, Part 1, The Early Years. I uh, hope you'll join us for that. And everyone, enjoy your Friday night. Thank you so much, and good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.